Welcome to another new year of Somerville Neighborhood News, Some Arts. Um, I'm Dave Ortega, and with me is a friend of Somerville Media Center, Greg Cook. Hi, thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Greg runs the, uh, the Wonderland blog, which is a blog that it's an aggregator of art information, uh, art happenings. Mm -hmm. And in your latest post, um, first of the year, uh, or last of first last of last that, year, yes. <laughs> whatever whatever post it was, uh, <coughs> it was a preview of upcoming art events, uh, noteworthy art events and exhibitions uh, going through the region um, up through the spring. Yes. And there's some pretty exciting stuff on there. Um, I know what stands out to me. <laughs> Let's talk about which ones stand out to you. Oh goodness. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really an amazing spring. We've got Frida Kahlo coming to the MFA and Monet coming to the Worcester Art Museum, uh, Botticelli coming to the Gardner. I think one show that really stands out to me is this show coming to the Fuller Craft Museum, mm. where they've done, um, they're down in Brockton, and they've really sort of taken this whole crack, craftivist movement, which is a activist crafters, mm. and sort of made that a central theme and become really um, engage with politics, particularly since the election of Trump. And so they had this new show by a photographer by the name of Tom Kiefer called The American Dream. And he's been photographing things left behind by migrants apprehended in Arizona. And so there are these uh, uh, strange and heartbreaking photos of um, like just groups of wallets, um, kids' toys. There's a whole one he has this just of Snickers bars, and they're all like it says satisfies over and over, and it's just this weird, ironic, sad comment wow. about the horrors of like America's border policies right now. And there's one also just of all these uh, water jugs that you know that really speaks to um, sort of like how do you make your way across this treacherous border? Uh, so. So ad addressing mm. immigration yeah. through these photographs. Yeah. And yeah. they also have a, a companion <coughs> piece yeah. or a companion exhibition to that um, with a, a welcome blanket. Yeah. The, um, 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 so Jaina Zweiman, who is one of the co-founders of the Pussy Hat Project, which was kind of this iconic uh, white feminist project of, with the Women's March when, uh, during the Trump inauguration, has come with this new theme where they're going to have inviting people all over the world and the country to knit uh, coverlets, blankets, and they're going to group them all together with the idea that they would make one giant one that would run the whole border wall, the mm -hmm. length of that. And it's this, um, again, it's craftivi this craftivism thing where they're um, using kind of the, the way craftivism often speaks about home and comfort and love, like how we care for each other, and turning it uh, into this protest about how do we embrace people who are arriving in this country. So, mm. And so uh, when are each of those taking place? They both open on January 26th. Oh, okay. And so, and yeah. Fuller Craft <laughs> Museum. Definitely. I have not been out there, but um, I am definitely motivated to, based on, on these two shows. Yeah, you should yeah. check it out, yeah. Um, what else is coming in the pipeline? Um, probably, well, uh, Montserrat College of Art has a photo show coming up by Jess Dugan, who a lot of folks here might know because she went to school in Boston and, at, uh, and then moved to Chicago and St. Louis. And she's spent many years doing documentary photography of the, the uh, queer community, the LGBTQ plus community. And um, um, this new show looks is a, a rumination on uh, masculinity. And mm. so, um, both looking at men and people who uh, appear as men and sort of to think about what that means. And uh, uh, Jess Dugan's really, um, she's a really standout artist in this area. And in part, I think, because she uh, has that, own exp that experience herself. And so she gets access that other people don't have, but mm. also brings a real sensitivity that other people don't have. And so there's a real kind of uh, delicacy and feeling in her pho photographs, and that's so. so oh, pho photographs! So yeah, I was about yeah. to ask what kind of work it was. <laughs> yeah, photographs, forgive me. <laughs> <clears throat> and so that's coming to Montserrat College of Art in Beverly um, on the 14th, mm. and she's going to be speaking there, I think, the following week or later that week. So she'll be in town. Um, so she's really somebody to check out. Very nice. Uh -huh. uh, queer meditations <clears throat> on masculinity. Yep. yep. Sounds uh, sounds exciting. What, what stood out to you? 
What's that? What's that on the list to you? What were you thinking? Um, I saw um, Trent Doyle Hancock. Oh, yeah. And I follow him on Instagram, and uh, I, I love his work. Um, you, you know that he's really influenced by comics. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's a Houston-based artist, as you write. And, uh, and I've just seen some of his installations that um, have to do with like toys and this mm. kind of uh, branding of this fictional toy that looks a little bit like a Cabbage Patch doll, but it, it yeah. looks like him. And uh, I've also seen some of his drawings, and his drawings, which are, are really influenced by comics, are really uh, layered and exciting, and um, just all his his personal symbols as well, intermixed with uh, with other kinds of symbolism. Um, yeah, that's that's exciting to me. Um, where where is that? That's at Mass Mocha. I mean, Mass Mocha out of North Adams in way Western Mass, and he. I mean, he's an artist you don't really get to see much around here, and so no. it's really exciting to have some of that work come here. Um, his background, he was like, has a Baptist evangelical upbringing and then also combines with kind of comics and Greek mythology and makes these big kind of uh, narrative paintings about his own mythology that he's mm. created. So, yeah, yeah definitely. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward yeah. to that. It's worth the drive out to Mass Mocha yeah. if, if nobody's been out there. It's a long ways out there, especially if you're living on the east, yeah. on the, the east coast as we are, but <laughs> it's, it's worth it. You can do it in a day if you really race it. It's really amazing. Um, but he, also if you're out there, you should see the um, James Terrell installations where he has these incredible uh, visionary light installations. Have you been out there to see them yet? I've not. <clears throat> the, so, the last time I was at Mass Mocha, just uh, interjecting this very quickly, I, uh, 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 some friends of mine and I went to go see Antony and the Johnsons perform. Oh, wow. About, <laughs> but this was about <laughs> almost 20 years ago. So. <laughs> they have a really great music program, too, that, you, that people should check out. Uh, outdoor indoor, uh, stuff, and they have this incredible like old factory site that they use. Mm. Um, but James Terrell was a kind of 60s L.A. artist, part of this um, whole group of... Um, artists who did stuff that are kind of immersive light installations. So in his, you walk into these rooms and it's like you're within this, you're like within light. I don't know how to explain mm. it. it. It's almost like, it's like being in like 2001 in the future or oh, something like wow. that. But they're um, like, they're, they're meditative and transcendental. And you know, like there's one that's like you're sort of walking, um, they have these kind of smooth, the, all the edges are sort of disappeared. And so you feel like almost like you're walking in a cloud. Mm. They're, they're very, um, I don't know. They're they're, yeah. They're just incredible. They're hard wow. to like. They're, you have to really experience them to see them. But they're another thing you really rarely had seen anywhere on the East Coast in in a long, long time. And so to have they have this, they have this big installation of like a dozen of his uh, of his pieces. And so mm. they're really worth. Um, it's a really rare and, and incredible things to go out and see. So, yeah. Well, touching on, on comics again, um, the art and wit of Rube Goldberg at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Yeah, Rube Goldberg was this guy, he was this newspaper comic cartoonist, uh, early 20th century, who, um, uh, I think he started in Chicago, if I recall, um, mm. and ended up in New York, and made his name with these comics that were um, um, basically stupidly complex invented machines to, to, to achieve very simple uh, and so it'd be like a really complicated thing that would just like crack open an egg and to start making your breakfast or something like right, that. Right, right. And so we know that term, Rube Goldberg, because that, that became so famous, it still comes down to us as these kind of compl overly complicated uh, contraptions. And a lot of people don't realize the, the comic the yeah. co a comic book or a comic strip roots of, of that term. Yeah. So this is a chance to rediscover the weirdo guy who invented that joke thing that still uh, you know comes to us to, to this day very cool yeah i'm looking forward to that uh in march definitely that's march at i don't know when rockwell museum out in stockbridge uh march 2nd there's also a comic show coming to the eric carl museum which is an amazing uh, museum mostly of uh children's picture books uh out in amherst and they have a show called out of the box that's opening on february 10th mm. and um i mean as you, you know comics so well and i mean i think comics there's this whole, this whole revolution of comics since the 60s of kind of underground comics and then kind of I don't know, alternative comics in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And a lot of that was how to take these kind of superhero comics for kids and make them more sophisticated and complicated and grown up and with all the messiness of grown up and grown upness involved in them and make them longer. And so then what's happened in the last like 10, 20 years is this um, taking that sophistication and going back and making like young adult graphic novels. And so it's kind of funny thing, there was this whole 
repeated headline that comics aren't for kids anymore. And now there's this like where sort of the most interesting stuff is happening is these new comics for kids. I would agree with that. Um, yeah. And so uh, many of them are women. And so they, uh, um, I'm forgetting it's Leonard Marcus, who's a kind of a, a uh, kind of the, one of the most important kind of scholars of children's books in the country, has put together a show that really brings in sort of the, the top people of this whole field. And that's mm -hmm. going to be at again, in Amherst at the Eric Carle Museum starting in February. A couple other things, I mean, I think, you know, with, I mean, another theme with Jess Dugan is kind of queer stuff, queer art, um, and the Museum of Fine Arts has a show called Gender Bending Fashion mm. that's coming in uh, March. It's a major show sort of serving uh, the sort of gender fluidity in fashion um, with uh, designers like uh, John Paul Gaultier, I'm gonna say all these wrong people from Gucci, uh, Ray. I'm gonna. I'm gonna not even try because I'm gonna. <laughs> and also, sort of famous stars like David Bowie, Jimi Hendrix, or Marlena Dietrich. Um, how like clothes they wore, or like show their fashion, and sort of explore this topic as well. So uh -huh. um, that's coming through. That's exciting. Yeah, and uh, it should be a big show. I mean, a kind of expansive show um, in March. Um, I just scrolling through your website here. <clears throat> uh, I touched on the Bauhaus and Harvard, and. Um, a lot of people are really, really like gaga over Bauhaus architecture in this area because there's a lot of really um, good examples. The key one, I think, being Boston City Hall. Yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> so people have many interesting feelings about the Boston City Hall, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Bauhaus was a school that started in, the, in Germany in, I think, the 1920s. And it was, um, and in some way, it relates to sort of that, that, you know, like the target stores motto of sort of design for everyone. Yeah. But it was this kind of like modernist notion of taking kind of uh, new geometric, you know, uh, mechanical design and making some, you know, mass producing it. So ideally be more available to everyone, but it was still mostly available for more right. upper class folks. And, um, they're also super influential of trying to merge sort of the fine arts with kind of like uh, commercial arts and design and architecture. And I think also the way they taught, um, like they really influenced, um, I mean, because they, they sort of this leveling of the arts, they also changed how art schools taught. And um, you don't see that everywhere, but like it's really been significant how people get taught art since then. And then what happened is, um, like many things in Germany that got on the wrong, the Nazis were offended yeah. by them. And so they drove, they forced the school to close, and basically uh, most of the key people fled. And um, the Nazis were more looking to like Roman architecture <coughs> and classical architecture. And yeah, they, they had didn't whole, understand the modernist. Like, what thought, is this stuff? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the Nazis had all sorts of yeah. horrible things they did. They had a lot of horrible <laughs> ide ideas. And so, yeah. Um, but basically, they drove all these people out, and they a bunch of them landed around Chicago. Mm. Um, uh, Mies van der Rohe, the, the big architect, was there and taught there. And then around Boston, particularly at Harvard, where one of the founders of, of the Bauhaus, uh, Walter Gropius, came and taught architecture for m many years. And so um, Boston became a center of this kind of, uh, of this modernist architecture. And I mean, I think that, like, I am friends with people who've worked really hard to sort of um, um, Reclaim the kind of the architecture that's now at the Boston City Hall. It's they're definitely legacy, but they'd say they're somewhat separate, I guess. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it, like um, the Boston City Hall is is that legacy of kind of concrete geometric modernism and sort of the big um, muscular yeah. architecture or something like that. And I'm, um, I'm correcting I'm correcting myself here. Um, it's brutalist architecture, yeah, Boston City yeah, Hall, yeah. Not, not so much Bauhaus, but. Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing that, uh, that I don't have this on my list, um, but one thing that's exciting, I guess, I mean, <laughs> I think it's really exciting, is that um, I believe it's the 50th anniversary of the opening of Boston City Hall is coming, I think, in February. Oh. And so there's events and things planned around that. And um, so keep your eyes you know, peeled for that. It's, I think, going to be at City Hall and other places, but around February. Um, cool. I was meaning there's um, a number of people, but in particular, um, Mark Pasnick and Chris Grimley, and I'm forgetting their friend who who worked really hard over the last uh, 10, 15 years to kind of create a new sense of, um, they've been at the forefront of um, reclaiming brutalist architecture and sort of thinking about what it meant. And um, so they're also part of this project around Boston City Hall now. They're uh, over under? Or they yeah, they're over under, yeah, right, okay. over in uh, the South End, and they have yeah. a gallery there called um, Pink Kama as well. Yeah. But they also do publications that are really interesting looks at um, 
they have a book called Heroic that really looked at um, people. They're trying to rename brutal. Yeah, Heroic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're going off on a brutalist tangent here. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to mention one other, like, a couple other things. One sure. is um, uh, at the ICA coming up, just like, she's probably there right now, Nina Chanel Abney. Um, her show opens in January 17th. She um, is an artist from Illinois and now in, in Brooklyn, I believe, who, New York. And she does these kind of big muralistic graphic paintings. And they're, they're bringing her in to do the mural, uh, the big wall in the lobby there. That's exciting. And she, um, her paintings are really kind of graphic and flat. Um, she needs a lot of stenciling and spray paint. And um, they're also inspired by emojis. And so, and they deal with like, um, you know, being a person of color in the United mm. States, and both from kind, you know, just ordinary life to kind of like in this one, they're saying it has to do with um, true and false information, liberal racism, and abuses of power. Uh. And so I expect it to be kind of um, both kind of like he, her stuff is really catchy, but also pointed. I think in this case, yeah. So. The that ICA art wall, um, it can. It, it's a tough one to crack, I think, yeah. for certain artists. And um, it's an odd shape. It's so tall, and it's like not really square. It's, yeah, you know, like kind of like big. And then it's like that big window. It's really, it's yeah, it's but daunting. But I'm excited to see uh, what Nina does, um, just based Definitely. on on the work that I've I've seen the work on your blog and and some other uh, works of hers. Uh, it, it, it's it's going to be exciting, I think. Is there something else you wanted, or the other ones that you thought of that? Uh, you? you mentioned Frida Kahlo. I'm looking forward to that at the MFA. Yeah. Um, I mean. And uh, I was at the MFA this weekend, and uh, something that didn't make your list, but uh, Graciela Iturbide, yeah. her, her uh, famous Mexican photograph uh, photographer, her photographs are going to be on display later later yeah. this month, all the way through May. I think she's supposed to be here next. I think she's supposed to be in town, and she's supposed to be visiting next Thursday. I'm not sure what the public events are around here, but yeah, you, can you, do you want to talk about her? Because like she's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, uh, I don't know too much about her. She's still alive. She's in her 70s in Mexico City, uh, based out of Mexico City. Um, uh, I, I know that she's, she's just been a very iconic Mexican photographer, yeah. uh, shooting indigenous subjects and uh, kind of uh, gritty urban realities and yeah. gritty rural realities. Uh, so I'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing her, her work. Uh, the, the famous work of hers with the um, uh, indigenous woman mm -hmm. wearing a hat of iguanas <laughs> on her head. That's going to be in this show, and uh, I think it's on loan from the Brooklyn Museum. Yeah. And uh, that's that's. I think they're publishing a book too of her work that you can check out too. Very so, cool. Yeah, I'm hoping I get the chance. I'm looking forward to seeing the show. I'm hoping I get a chance to talk to her about her work next week. So Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Good luck um, with that. I mean, I think. I mean, I, what's, I think one thing that like an overarching thing to notice about like what's happening in museums right now, and then Frida Kahlo, then this the, that show as well, is that. I mean, I think since Black Lives Matter and since the election of Trump that. Like museums had really been kind of apolitical or trying, you know, avoiding of kind of social. I mean, they sort of there was sort of a social justice theme a little bit, but mm -hmm. like museums have really been activated by the kind of current politics and what their audience is craving in response to that. And so, what, you know, like what we're really seeing is like institutions and curators doing a lot with uh, artists of color, women artists, like mm -hmm. the, uh, um, queer artists, like folk, and making that kind of at the forefront. These kind of like uh, issues of equality and, and social justice that had been, um, museums had been kind of like leery to sort of address head on often. And so, um, so like for, for example, the Frida Kahlo show, you know, like, I mean, we all know how amazing an artist she's been and she was. Like, she's this incredible surrealist, Mexican, radical, communist, socialist mm -hmm. artist. Um, did the incredible dreamy self portraits. Uh, and um, um, I mean, I think there's been an issue partly like, People knew how good she was, and so her work was rare. But it's also because of racism and stuff like that, her work just wasn't seen or toured, and like it wasn't art, you know, and sexism. And so you see museums like, uh, so the MFA is going to do this show about, it sounds like kind of a small show, but amazing show still because it's rare to see her stuff um, um, starting in late February of her paintings, and looking also had her inspirations in. Uh, popular culture, like pop art and uh, commercial art and folk art, that sort of like she drew on to sort of as part of her imagery and both of her home and style. Mm. There's also a show coming to the Brooklyn Museum in New York that um, I think began in London. It uh, looks a lot at her her fashion sense and her clothing. And so if you want, like you can't get enough Frida, you need to you know, go down to Brooklyn and see that show too. And then come back to the MFA. Definitely. All right. <laughs> um, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was I was seeing somewhere online that um, you know where where 2017 was kind of the year of activism, yeah. and and they characterized last year 2018 as the year of rage. Mm. Um, and so, like you say, <laughs> here we are. Here we are in 2019, and a lot of institutions like. Uh, a lot of cultural institutions like uh, art museums, yeah. um, you know, this this kind of uh, activism and rage are now in an interesting place, and so yeah. curators and artists alike have a chance to to speak to the sources of that and offer solutions. Definitely, yeah. Well, uh, thank you. That seems uh, as good a place as any to uh, yeah. conclude this little segment here. Thank, um, thank you. It's been wonderful being here. Yeah. Thank you, Greg Cook. If you want to check out. Um, more of Wonderland, where should people go? Um, it's gregcookland.com slash Wonderland. So. All right. Thanks so much. Thank <laughs> you.